Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning. Um, at Burnfoot, they have had some very sad news in that one of their elders died extremely suddenly yesterday. So today is an unexpectedly united service. So I'm grateful to Bob Kirk and some of the elders who allowed me to cancel their service so I can go straight across from here to support them after I've finished. So there is tea and coffee, but if I dash off straight away, that's where I'm heading. Um, so we'll remember them. <coughs> so I don't know if anybody knew it was Ron Swinton, uh, so remember his family um, in our prayers today. Next week's worship is 9.30 at Ben Rool and 10.45 at Hogkirk because the Hogkirk and South Dean Guild have a soup fundraiser um, at 12 o'clock uh, to raise money for the Disaster Emergency Committee. So it would be nice for us all to support that at 12 o'clock in South Dean Hall next Sunday. Um, usual activities this week. The Lent Film and Chat continues on Wednesday um, at 7 o'clock in the Church Hall. And I'll leave you to read the rest of the notices for yourself. As darkness gives way to light, and winter sleep to fresh beginnings, let us come today to be reminded of God's love for us like the green shoots of renewed life stirring beneath the soil. Let us welcome an awakening of God's word in our lives. In this time of reflection and repentance, let us affirm our identity and our security as children of God. Open our worship singing 113, God the Father of creation, 113.
Let us go before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we wonder, can it really be that we see you all around? Lord, we wonder, can it really be that we feel you everywhere? Lord, we wonder, can it really be that we sense you in our lives? Show yourself to us, O oh Lord. Let us hear your voice, O oh God, in the business. We take time to be with you, not as often as we should, but as often as we feel we can. May we be more calm, more still, more silent, so that we can take more time to listen to you, to see you, to feel you, to experience you. Yet, Lord, it's hard to be still. It's hard to be silent. It's hard to do right. Lord, you know our hearts and all that is within us. You know our desires and our motivations. For those times that we have been too busy to care, too caught up to notice, too blind to see those around us, too silent to speak out where we should have. Forgive us. Lord, help us to take time, time to reflect on our lives, our relationships, our faith. Time to bring before you all that we ought. Hear our prayers, Lord, our prayers of confession. In every moment, in every journey, in every conversation, in everything, God be with us, sustaining us, loving us, guiding us. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. We say together the words of prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Our first Bible reading this morning is Psalm 25, verses 1 to 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast, love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. And then we turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 9 to 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove them out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, 
and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Amen. We sing now hymn 21, Lord, teach me all your ways. 21. <laughs>
time, various traditions uh, evolved around this. Um, and eventually it became limited more just to Lent, rather, so just the seven weeks rather than nine weeks. And some tradi tri Christian traditions still follow this to the point of which they parade out of the church uh, on Ash Wednesday, usually, and actually bury the Alleluias literally with it. It's very whole what have you. We're just doing it symbolically. And I thought it was a good, interesting, and different reminder of the beginning of Lent, and also as a symbol of solidarity for all those who are locked away in suffering in the world today. So I'm going to pass a bag around. Obviously, the nice pretty bag that I was thinking of using and stood looking at is still where I stood looking at it. So I will pass around a big bag. And if you put your alleluias in that, I will then transfer them and we'll take them each week with us to worship until Easter Sunday. Okay. So, and yes, it's all going to be very, very artistic and symbolic and Easter eggs and whatnot. I will put the eggs in there, but I promise not to eat them on the way out. And then we will unlock them on Easter Sunday. Put the alleluias away and clear out the fridge as symbols of the decluttering that we desire in our lives. For the call to repentance comes to us today to be embraced not as a once for all, but as a discipline to be repeated time and again. In high seasons and in low, in busyness and in quiet, finding wilderness spaces allows us to turn again to the God whom we lost in all the distractions that life presents. The God who looks into our eyes, tells us we are beloved children, and then reveals the work that only we can do. God calls us to trek through the wilderness, in preparation for striving through life, focused on God's mission, to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and let the oppressed go free. So we continue now by singing 337, 40 days and 40 nights. We <coughs>
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Lent is, of course, traditionally a time of giving up in remembrance of Jesus' self-denial in the wilderness. In recent times, Christians have sought to make self-deprivation of Lent more meaningful by taking up some kind of activity that has more significant spiritual significance or benefits others in some way. And these practices are based on the longer accounts of Jesus' days in the wilderness that we find in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, in which Jesus is tempted to assuage hunger by turning stones into bread, to test God's protection of him by flinging himself up a high place, and finally being offered all worldly power if only he kneels down and worships Satan. But as we have observed in recent weeks, Mark's Gospel is short and to the point. In less than the number of verses his fellow Gospel writers devote to the temptation alone, Mark covers Jesus' baptism, temptation and the beginning of his ministry. At the film and chat session on Wednesday, the question was raised as to why Mark's Gospel does not appear first in the New Testament if it was the first to be written. And that's because the early church father who put together the canon of scripture just assumed that Mark's Gospel was a summary of Matthew and Luke. It wasn't until many, many centuries later scholars realised that Mark was written first and used by Matthew and Luke as source material for the Gospels. Given the short length of Mark and the speed with which he recounts the life of Jesus, this was perhaps an understandable conclusion. The brevity of Mark, though, can help sharpen our focus. It encourages us to ponder on the interlinking of several passages that would be difficult in the longer versions of the other Gospels. Without the details of the three temptations to distract us, we have an opportunity to reflect more deeply on the relationship between Jesus' baptism and the 40 days he spent in the wilderness. <coughs> Until this point in his life, as far as we know, Jesus appeared to have been living the life of an ordinary carpenter in the backwater of Nazareth in Galilee. Even Matthew and Luke give no information about his early days beyond the wondrous circumstances of his birth and his wanderings in the temple as an adolescent. But then, as the ministry of his cousin John is coming to an end, Jesus is baptised by him into the Jordan. But this is no mere sprinkling of water upon his head, or even a gentle dunking. It is a world-shattering event, which sees the heavens not just parted, but torn apart. We might wonder why Jesus presented himself for a baptism which John was administering as a sign of repentance. Why was it necessary for someone who was without sin? Within the context of this passage relating to the beginning of his ministry, it becomes possible for us to consider that Jesus was not so much being washed free from sin as being washed free of earthly claims upon him. He was no longer subject to the rule of either Roman occupiers or Jewish authorities. As he emerges from the waters of the Jordan, and the heavens are torn apart, the same Spirit of God that moved over the face of the waters at the world's creation descends upon him and shows that God is about to begin remaking the broken, sin-filled creation. As God claims him as his beloved son, Jesus emerges as the first citizen of God's new empire, free of obligation to anyone and anything but God and God's coming rule. The sheer drama of the event demonstrates that Jesus' baptism was far more than a symbol of repentance. It is the authority by which his ministry commences. Just as any earthly leader planning on bringing about a new empire would spend time in preparation and military exercises, Jesus is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness for a time of spiritual preparation, justified by the knowledge that he is God's beloved son. 
In contrast to Matthew and Luke, the Greek word that Mark used to describe this period is not that of temptation, but of testing. Unlike the accounts of Matthew and Luke, it is not a theological conversation with the devil, but a 40-day life or death, spirit authorized struggle in a place of vulnerability. While animals show up, angels wait upon him. The temptation in Mark is not words, but an apocalyptic struggle that Jesus survives. His time in the wilderness is not so much a test to be passed or failed, but a necessary time of development as the fully human and fully divine Son of God. Jesus emerges from the wilderness, being utterly clear about his relationship with God, about whom he is, who he is called to be and of the mission before him. Having come through this spirit-driven test by Satan, Jesus points not to himself, but announces God's ultimate purpose. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This accounting mark of Jesus' time in the wilderness is not then just leading us from a chocolate to a temporary non-chocolate existence for seven weeks. It calls us instead to envisage a kind of holy disruption, grounded in the longing for God to set things right. It's a time for us to think about our wanderings in the wilderness, figuratively and literally. These early verses of Mark's Gospel are dark, because the world that Jesus has entered is dark. Life is full of times of wilderness, of pain, despair and uncertainty. It can feel there is no reason for alleluias, that our songs of praise to the Lord could be put away forever. We ourselves might feel like the Israelites exiled in Babylon, who asked in Psalm 137, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? However, the angels that ministered to Jesus remind us that he was not alone in his wilderness experiences, and neither are we. And when we turn to the words of Psalm 25 that we heard, we are reminded that the ways of the Lord can be discerned best when we devote time to listening to God's directions. The psalm is a prayer for help from God in relieving the speaker from some unspecified trouble against some enemies. It asks God to instruct, to be merciful and forgive, and to remember. Like all prayers, it is not simply a summoning of God to perform a service, but rather the placing of trust and hope in the relationship that exists between God and his people. Here the role of the Lord is to provide help, whilst the role of the psalmist is of one who waits on the Lord. This waiting is not a passive action, but requires preparation and being ready to act when the time of God's deliverance comes. Together with that understanding of Jesus' experience in the wilderness, the psalm reminds us that the way through times of darkness can be found when we spend time waiting for God. And in order to hear him, it's helpful sometimes to spend time quite literally in whatever form the wilderness takes for us, and taking us away from the callings of the world, reminding ourselves that in our baptism God called each of us to be beloved. Some of us it might be a walk in the woods, some it might just be a time quiet in the garden. Find your way, find your wilderness, find your space where you can spend time with God. Lent is not a time to give things up for the sake of giving up, but to give up or take up that which helps us become more focused on God. It's a time to take ourselves away, to contemplate on those things that are causing us to be tested, to be willing to be taken to the brink and back again in discerning God's purpose for ourselves. So pray, read scripture, reflect, spend time with yourself, thinking, feeling, remembering all the things that make you you, for better and for worse. Be generous to others, especially those in need. Engage in ways that believe injustices and oppression. Travel through Lent quietly, deeply, attentively. 
reorientate yourself towards the cross and look forward to rejoicing in the new life that will emerge on Easter morning as we release the Alleluia's of today. Take a moment of quiet reflection. In you, Lord God, we put our trust. When we are tested, it is to you we turn. When we are tempted, it is in you we find strength to resist. When we are lonely, it is to you we come for consolation. Show us your ways, Lord God. Teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth. For in you we find hope, mercy and love. Amen. We sing now the hymn that's on your cheek that you were given. You call us to the wilderness. <coughs>
We bring to God those filled with bitterness and resentment, at brutality and injustice. Those whom God does not condemn, but whom God welcomes and longs to crave in love. We bring to God those for whom our attempts at Lent and austerity are laughable, for those who know real poverty and need. And we know that the Christ of the wilderness hangs back, slowing his step, so that he can walk alongside all who are bound down with the heavy burden that life may have become. The Christ of the wilderness offers food for the journey, healing for the road, strength for the weary, comfort for the sovereign, grace, peace and love beyond our ken. Lord, we remember today all those known to us who are suffering, all those known to us who are bereaved. We think of our fellow Christians at the Congregation of Burnfoot today. We think too of all those who have lost loved ones suddenly and unexpectedly. Bring them all your comfort and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We close our worship now with 644. O oh Jesus, I have promised. Six more. <coughs>
your wilderness place amongst the chaos of life. Find God present there, revealing the purpose for your life, and in loving service, know the blessing of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, today and always.